All right, guys, we are moving into week three with one of the rare, rare weeks that we look at just one um, artistic period, which is crazy, um, which is post-impressionism. So um, this rarely happens that we just look at one movement, sadly, because of modern art being so sort of vast in its numerous movements. But this week, we're just focusing on post-impressionism. And I know we covered a lot of things last week. Um, six movements in total so it was quite a bit of information um this is going to be a um, little more condensed this week with just focusing on one movement and sort of moving through um some particularly important works for that period Ooh, just one period a uh, post impressionism so in post-impressionism, artists came to sort of reject impressionism and its um, overall limitations. Although they continued to use vivid colors, thick application of paint, and real-life subject matter. However, they moved away from the study of spontaneous light and color to distorting for expressive effect, often to express deeper emotions or symbolism. So kind of moving towards expressionism um, and where you'll see this very sort of um, taking off and that the um, use of color is much more sort of expressive um, versus um, naturalistic. They were also inspired by stained glass, folk art, um, Japanese prints, and featuring um, simplified drawings, flattened space, and anti-naturalistic color. So these are some examples here um, of kind of this stained glass window type um, creation of art. It's very much kind of in the idea of cloisonne, um, which is sort of a type of um, decorative work on pottery um, or glassware. Um, decorative work at which enamel, glass, or gemstones are separated by strips of flattened wire um, place edgeways on a metal backing. So this sort of thickness of the line um, with the sort of mixing of color as well. So this was very inspiring to post-impressionists um, as well as Japanese printmaking. So we'll see that continue to sort of be um, a valuable part of post-impressionism. But again, keep remembering that um, all of these artists are really inspired by the flatness of Japanese printmaking and sort of the color blocking, um, but not necessarily in sort of the content or value of those works on their own. Um, so kind of a very simplistic view of Japanese prints. Roger Fry coined the term post-impressionism in 1918 as a broad reaction against impressionism in avant-garde painting. Um, they often were exhibited together, but they did not um, kind of agree together on one concept or idea, um, which you're going to see in modernism a lot, that even though a group of people is set into a specific movement like expressionism, um, you're going to see them kind of dealing with these concepts in very different ways. Post-impressionism is um, quite well known for sort of having a group of people that don't really go together. Um, so this is how I kind of um, recently saw it read together. Van Gogh and Gauguin are rejecting interest in depicting the observed world. They instead looked at their memories and emotions in order to connect with the viewer on a deeper level. Versus Cezanne and Seurat, uh, structure, order, and optical effects of color dominated by this aesthetic vision into relations of color and shape in the world around them. Post-Impressionism also was quite tired of the subject matter of Impressionist works. And you may have noticed this a little bit in um, when we looked at Impressionism and looked at artists like Monet, that a lot of their work, or Renoir too, is a good example, that a lot of their um, subject matter is sort of middle-class figures, kind of vacationing. Um, it seems a little kind of vapid um, and though it's sort of pretty and um, interesting to look at it kind of is sort of one view one experience in particular so with something like Renaud War's work um, in the Moulin de la Gaillette um, you see sort of the post-impressionist kind of rejecting this idea um, of sort of the happy um, summer um, sort of gaiety of the figures and um, them dancing and frolicking about um, is very much so not something that post-impressionism is going to focus on um, in their work. Though I would say kind of that Seurat does. Um, 
every artist is here to break the rule, I suppose. Um, but um, he's a little different because he's mostly focused on color theory in his work and was very sort of interested in the law of simultaneous contrast of colors. And so I'm going to teach you a couple of different terms um, in how Seurat is defining his um, production of art um, and brushstrokes in his work. So there's kind of three words and or terms slash movements um, that all kind of come into the same idea, but are all sort of used differently to describe Seurat as an artist. So um, divisionism and pointillism um, are about how when two colors are placed side by side, in theory, um, these sort of dots would merge in the viewer's eyes and produce the impression of other colors. Um, they were kind of mixed together in your eye by placing the two colors together. Um, so for example, according to um, Chevriol, um, each color would impose its own contemporary on its neighbor. If red is placed next to blue, the red will cast a green tint on the blue, altering it to a greenish blue, um, while the blue imposes a pale orange on the red. Um, and that's what it would create the impression of other colors um, in this sort of mosaic form. Now, this never really worked out um, very well for Seurat in his work, um, mostly because uh, these dots were too large um, or it just sort of generally gave this kind of grainy appearance. He tried sort of different um, sizes of dots and different ways of putting the dots on the canvases and never really made it sort of seamless so that you could see um, none of the sort of texture from afar. It um, You still kind of see the separated dots um, that he was trying to sort of get rid of. Very much so kind of this grainy appearance in images. Um, so in something like this, you can tell that these dots kind of blend together a little more, but it's still this kind of grainy appearance in images. I kind of think it's soft and lovely in a lot of ways. Um, it has sort of a lot of tex texture and vitality, um, very much kind of in the realm of movement um, in the Impressionist era, but it's not really what Seurat intended um, in his work in particular. And the other idea is neo-impressionism, um, which is the rejection of random spontaneity of impressionism in favor of measured painting technique grounded in science and the study of optics. Seurat wanted to apply color scientifically, calculating what hue should be placed next to each other and in what combination. Um, and so he was playing with um, these kind of sets of constructs to create his work. So you probably know his most famous work, um, which is A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Grande Jatte um, from 84 to 86, which as at, is at the Chicago Art Institute. And like I said before, this is one of his most famous works. Um, it took about a year to create with 27 preliminary drawings and 30 color sketches. And this leisure activity is very typical of Impressionists. Um, but the rigorous divisionist technique, stiff formality of the figures, and highly calculated geometry of the composition produced a solemn abstract effect, effect quite at odds with the casual, casual, oh my goodness, casual naturalism of earlier impressionism. So you have sort of these social classes participating in various park activities. Um, it was a very popular place for a weekend or holiday amusement. Um, it very much has this kind of busy energy um, with these sort of complementary hues. Um, and like I said before, the the painting as a whole did not work out the way he wanted to in the use of pointillism, but um, it is really gorgeous and has this really sort of um, kind of buzzing effect with the kind of color to border around it that he created as sort of um, inverted colors. And it's crazy to see um, these sort of luxury figures um, walking around and this woman who um, has a pet monkey here um, as well, who kind of looks like a ghost. Um, but this sort of um, stiffness, but also leisure and relaxation to it. And this work is very much supposed to be sort of a um, foil to um, his other bathers, which is across um, the river here. So it's supposed to look like um, the kind of working class on the other side of the um, 
of the river, which I didn't put in this presentation. Um, but they're always shown together in the Chicago Art Institute that um, when you see a Sunday afternoon on the Grand Jot, um, I think like right behind it is like some of the little studies of the other bathers. And here it is in the museum. It's quite large, um, obviously. And so when you go up to it, even afar here, the colors do blend, but you can still see this texture, right? This texturing that he does with the dots um, from far away. Um, you might know this work um, from Ferris Bueller's Day Off in 1986, um, the movie, if you've seen it. Um, they sort of run around the museum and look at very popular um, works. Um, by a lot of impressionists and post-impressionists. I'll put that video on the Moodle if you guys want to watch it as they sort of run through the Chicago Art Institute. But this is one of those movies, movies, this is one of those images that really um, has a lot of sort of popular culture appeal. You see any number of movies, TV shows reproducing these images um, on the river. It just is sort of an I icon of... Um, painting as a whole. Paul Cezanne is another great post-impressionist painter. Um, he didn't have much success in his life until sort of later, and he studied in Paris as part of the realist group surrounding Manet, and in the early 1870s changed his style with the influence of Pizarro and adopted a bright palette, broken brushwork, and everyday subject matter. Um, and he opened also help kind of the transition from Impressionism to Cubism. When we talk about Picasso um, and Brock, excuse me, we will see um, how much Brock and Picasso were inspired by him as an artist. Um, he was also very interested in the sensation of nature and to create a sense of order in nature through metho methodo methodical application of color. Uh, and he often painted in Provence in solitude, um, which is in France. And so a lot of his work is very much sort of of the scenery around him and his home. So one of his well-known works is Still Life with Basket of Apples from um, 1890 to 94. And these objects have this kind of table as a whole has a lot of spatial ambiguity. Um, it appears like objects are sort of incorrectly drawn. You have sort of the bottle um, tilting precariously. You have the fruit basket appears to be dumping its contents. While um, there's a white cloth only thing keeping the apples from falling over the floor. And you can sort of see that here in that close up that um, it kind of looks like this whole structure might come down. Um, it's very sort of precarious. Um, which I use in this quote as well. Um, you also have the sense that this table is very tilted. Um, when you look across here um, to sort of visualize uh, this space, you can tell that the table does not um, sort of meet itself on the other side of this cloth. So um, it does give this very sort of particular feeling that the table is slanting or that it is not stable as a whole. Um, it doesn't have any right angles and it's kind of a multitude of viewpoints. Um, by tilting the wine bottle out of the vertical flattening, f vertical flattening and distorting the perspective of the plate or changing the direction of the table edge underneath the cloth, Cezanne was able, able while maintaining the appearance of actual objects to concentrate on the relations and tensions existing amongst them. So, Really what his work was about um, was about dynamism, um, that sort of um, realistic or realistic still life could never possess um, while he's having sort of this disregard for linear perspective and trying to look at, at objects with these inanimate objects um, in sort of a more active, complex and dynamic way. And he's really kind of the first artist to do this, to really play um, with some of these constructs of multiple viewpoints um, and sort of precarious scenes. And then you can sort of see that move into cubism as we get there as well. Another famous work by Paul Cezanne is Mont Sante Victorie um, from 1902 to 1904. And this is a very sort of 
um, famous series of works that he did of this mountain. Um, after 1890, his brush strokes, brush strokes became larger and more abstractly expressive, the contours more broken and dissolve, the color floating across the canvas sustaining its, its own identity, independent of the objects it defined. He focused on this kind of classical landscape idea, but each stroke has its own sound, part of sort of this larger, larger image as a whole. It was a really famous mountain um, in the area that he lived in France, in Provence, and um, it commanded a great presence, and it's really um, where a lot of his sort of post-impressionist tendencies sort of come to pass, because you can see um, these very sort of momentous and quick-moving brush strokes that he's utilizing to depict um, this sort of mountainscape. His strokes are very short and kind of have these parallel hatchings to sketchy lines to broader swaths of flat color, not only to record his sensations of nature, but also weave every element of the landscape together, um, very much a sense of flatness. Um, there's kind of three sections of the work as the whole. Um, there's kind of this band of foliage um, on the bottom and then this set of sort of houses. You can see some of them here um, and then the mountainscape in the background with the blues, violets, and grays um, that very much sort of blend into the sky. And it's kind of crazy to think about the way that he is color blocking on here. Um, it's very much something that you have not seen before um, in the modernist period. Period. He painted this scene around 30 times um, up until the 1880s. Um, up from the 1880s until his death. And so you can see this mountain from sort of the numerous um, viewpoints around um, his home. So it really became this sort of very important um, work for him. A work that we're not really going to talk about a lot, um, but I sort of want to mention because we're going to come back to it when we look at cubism, um, is The Bathers from 1898 to 1905. And this is also another topic um, that he painted a lot that inspired sort of cubists and fauvist artists. And he worked on this work for seven years, and it was unfinished until his death in 1906. Um, but very much sort of looking at the traditional idea of the nude and playing with it, kind of the breakdown of bodily forms um, in this very sort of expressive way. So we will see um, very much so the cubists using this as well. And again, still kind of using the female subject in this sort of, I would say, slightly derogatory way. Um, but we're starting to sort of get out of that um, dialogue as well. Gauguin is sort of our next stop in um, the white males of um, post-impressionism. Um, Gauguin is an interesting figure, and we kind of talked about him in uh, class this week, um, as in yesterday, um, as sort of a controversial figure, and we'll get into that. Um, but Gauguin grew up in Peru, um, until he was seven, um, which kind of put the desire in him to travel. And he started his life as a stockbroker. Um, but when the stock market crashed in 1883, he b abandoned his wife and five children to be a painter um, after he started training kind of with Cezanne and Pizarro. We're going to talk about that um, again shortly, but um, he started sort of practicing in the post-impressionist movement um, and really kind of developed this idea of um, synesthetism. Um, which I am not good at saying, so I'm sorry. Um, Gauguin wanted to synthesize three features, the outward appearance of natural forms, the artist's feelings about their subject, the purity of the aesthetic considerations of line, color, and form. Um, synthesis of subject and idea with form and color to express invisible meanings and emotions, wanted color to express intrinsic feelings of subject matter, figures, and artists. This is really important for how we view a lot of post-impressionism, um, even Cezanne and especially sort of Van Gogh, um, as well as other artists. Who else are we looking at that I want? Um, to lose Lautrec a little as well. Um, but mostly in sort of um, Gauguin and Van Gogh's work. Um, as they sort of famously work together um, ever so br briefly, as we will talk about, um, we have these artists utilizing 
brush strokes and color um, as a way to express emotion and feelings. And so you will see that continue greatly in Fauvism, in Expressionism. So this is sort of the start of that um, type of creation within art and painting. So, for example, this is one of Paul Gauguin's um, famous works, Vision After the Sermon, from 1888. He did a lot of different biblical scenes um, during his lifetime. This particular one depicts a scene where Jacob wrestles um, with either an angel um, or sort of a god figure in Genesis during a journey back to Canaan. Um, he's running from Esau, if you sort of have um, an idea of what this story is about. Um, and he's renamed Israel after fighting with this angel, um, which means to contend with God. Um, some people also say that the story is more metaphoric, meaning that Jacob was wrestling with his own conscience. Um, but nonetheless, this um, image is depicting that. And Gauguin goes to visit a colony in pont Avon in Brittany, and he met an artist there, Emile Bernard, um, who showed him sort of connections to Japanese prints and flatness. And here you have um, Gauguin depicting the Breton women in Brittany, um, or pont Avon, um, because of the way that they're wearing these little um, bonnets uh, that you see here. So this is um, typical of women in Breton, in Brittany, um, to wear these sort of caps. So you'll see them not only in Gauguin's work, but also in Van Gogh's work. He used kind of flat um, silhouettes and painted bright colors around these figures. And then you have the um, sort of stark red background um, with the um, figure of Jacob and the angel wrestling back here. And there's sort of some um, conversation about what this scene could be depicting. It could be that these women are sort of contemplating and were able to sort of create this vision, or maybe they're thinking about it, because you kind of have this separation of um, the tree here, which kind of makes it feel like this um, is more of the sort of reality and this is sort of the vision. Um, but nonetheless, these are sort of pious women kind of um, engaging in this biblical story. And the red is supposed to sort of um, have some connection to the Jabbok River, um, which is right here um, in sort of ancient Israel here, where um, Jacob would have in fact wrestled an angel. Now, Gauguin is very interested in Japanese prints. As I said previously, he is very much taking this imagery out of um, Hokusai's prints of is it Hokusai's? Yes, Hokusai's um, wrestling figures uh, to create this image, this sort of flat image in the back, as well as using that tree that moves, um, not this direction, but to the left actually in the painting, um, which is very much from Hiroshige's work, um, which is something Van Gogh copies as well. So utilizing this shape um, in his work as well. So you can see it here moving to the left. You have other sort of symbolic images like um, the apple tree, which is supposed to be a symbol for redemption, um, the 12 Breton women for 12 disciples. Um, Jacob is also going to have 12 sons. A uh, cow is a representation of redemption through work and toil. Um, it seemed to be a work that was not sort of accepted um, willingly by the religious community. They thought it was kind of horrific because of the bright red color. Um, but Gauguin was very much experimenting with um, sort of color theory and color play um, in his work. Now, coming back to sort of um, Gauguin's personal life, which is a big part of how we look at um, his next set of works. So it's kind of been typically believed um, that Gauguin had this sort of horrific wife um, and that she kind of drove him away, um, which sounds a little dramatic um, because I don't know any woman who wants to raise five children on her own. Um, but until now, the received opinion has been that Gauguin's wife was a bullying hearted Herodin, who chased her husband from the family home, but Matthews has discovered letters that prove that Matt God was in fact a clever, kind woman who was victimized physically, verbally, and emotionally by her husband. When I was 10 years old, the couple's son Emil wrote in a previously unpublished letter, I saw my father 
bloody my mother's face with his fist. Um, so it seems to be a sort of very negative relationship between Gauguin's first wife. Um, and when we have Gauguin sort of leaving his wife to become part of post-impressionism and to focus his work um, on painting, you have him eventually moving to um, Tahiti, and he moves there in 1981 and kind of stays there for most of his life and lives there for the next 12 years. And Gauguin's life in Tahiti is um, very sort of negative um, and um, controversial in a lot of ways. Um, this is Gauguin here. Um, I was looking into a couple of different articles to see sort of what different scholars say um, about Gauguin and um, his time in Tahiti. There was a New York Times article from recently that is it time that Gauguin got canceled, um, which states he set sail for Tahiti in 1891, searching for the exotic surroundings he had known as a boy in Peru. Gauguin spent most of the 12 remaining years of his life in Tahiti and on the French Polynesian island of Hiva'oa cohabitating with adolescent girls, fathering more children, and producing his best-known paintings, um, which is sort of a weird note to end on for uh, this quote. Um, but what you see here is that Gauguin takes a total of three wives, um, one of them being 13 years old and two of them 14, um, and gives them syphilis, which is uh, horrific. And he does die of um, syphilis complications at 54, um, which I believe is also what uh, Toulouse Lautrec dies of as well. When it's left untreated, it can be deadly. But um, it doesn't really take sort of a politically minded scholar or critic to recognize that his representations of new Tahitians reflect a sexual and racial fantasy forged from a position of patriarchal colonialist power. So when you start looking at images that he produced in Tahiti um, and the way that he represents it is very much not the way that it was at the time. Um, and I'm going to show you sort of how he talked about it um, and some articles talked about it as well. But he's kind of depicting it as um, this very sort of quote unquote primitive place that we're going to talk about what that means um but sort of very luxurious this kind of fantasy of a tropical island um and where Gauguin gets to kind of live out um his own sexual fantasies it's this very sort of horrific um contemplation of his work and everyone says this is his greatest work right and this is the greatest work that he's doing um but at what cost is he producing these sort of paintings um when Gauguin arrived in Tahiti, um, he said, it was the Tahiti of former times which I loved, he wrote, that of the present filled me with horror. To start, the girls weren't naked. They were dressed in bulky high-necked gowns, courtesy of the church. Um, Tahiti had been taken over by missionaries and sort of um, westernized in a lot of ways. He left the Tahitian capital for a more remote, pre-colonial parts of the island, but never quite found his exotic utopia of cultural difference, as art historian Stefan Eisenman aptly described it. So Gauguin, as many art historians agree, created his fantasy himself in both his canvases and writings. The bright tropical fabrics we see in the paintings were imported from Europe, and the mysticism he tried to pictorialize was a hybrid of European and Asian ancient Tahitian traditions. So when he's going through and painting these sort of famous paintings like Day of the God from 1894, um, in which he's trying to um, represent this kind of ancient Tahiti um, or, I don't know, tribal Tahiti, um, where you have these kind of central um, goddess figures of Hina um, and different women dancing, um, which is a suggestive of an ancient Tahitian dance that missionaries and colonial authorities tried to suppress. You have the middle sort of pink sand um, with the bather flanked by ambiguously gendered figures lying on their sides, um, potentially the trio of birth, um, death, and life, life and death. And it was probably um, supposed to be a representation of women bringing offerings to Hina in this sort of warm color of the land, um, very much sort of in syntheticism and what he's kind of trying to produce. But again, this work is not very much based in Tahitian people, what they're doing, who there are. It's this fantasy that Gauguin is trying to sell back to Westerners. 
And so this really comes to a problem in modern art, um, which is this focus on this construct of primitivism, which is really not a term we use in art history anymore, because to call something primitive um, is usually sort of using another culture in which um, you don't really understand and you sort of see as not as um, highly intellectual or as modern as you are um, to sort of push them down. So it's usually sort of um, non-white cultures, African cultures, etc. So Impressionists and Post-Impressionists drew inspiration from non-Western arts of Africa, pre-Columbian America, and Oceania to um, talk about this sort of primitive way of life that was sort of more valuable, more pure, and um, to create this sort of fantasy. So this belief that non-Western or pre-industrial societies are more pure, authentic than those of the West. Um, they are a resistance to progress, justifying aesthetic and economic exploitation through colonization um, is really what it comes down to, right? So these cultures that um, these artists are taking advantage of and utilizing in their work um, are really just a way for them to justify exploitation of these people. So to not only justify um, showing them in sort of explicit ways, um, but to also sort of colonize them in the 1800s as well. And so we're going to see not only Gauguin doing this in his work, but it's going to continue in Expressionism and Fauvism, that Cubism, um, Picasso is... Um, definitely a problem in this as well, that using this quote-unquote idea of the primitive um, to sort of talk about art and sell art, which is ridiculous. Um, this sort of many modernists believe the immersion in non-Western aesthetics gave them access to a more authentic state of being, uncorrupted by civilization and filled with primal spiritual energies. Um, and you can just hear that sort of coming um, from a very sort of racist um, point of view, right? A very sort of suppressed point of view um, in sort of utilizing these people in the way um, that Gauguin wants to. It has been quite inspiring to see um, Kahinda Wiley as of recently take on a lot of these things um, in some of his own work in um, having an exhibition that focus on rethinking Gauguin's images as a whole. Hopefully some of you have some idea of who Kahinda Wiley is, um, but his work has often been sort of taking on um, images of art history and reinventing them with people with limited voices, um, such as taking black men off the street in their street clothes and sort of placing them in art historical um, poses and images in these sort of grand art paintings. And so he took on um, Gauguin and his images of these quote unquote foreign people um, and created this work called Tahiti Kahinda Wiley um, in 2019, I believe it was just last year. And he looks at Gauguin's representation of this small island paradise with exotic beauties, um, which were unlike reality. And um, Ga Gauguin was really obsessed with this island of Mahu's community. Um, a group that classified in traditional Polynesian culture as being of a third gender that exists between male and female, um, which really kind of promoted um, colonial exploitation of the people by Gauguin because of their sort of fluidity. Um, and so what Wiley went and do is to sort of reimagine these works outside of the Gauguin narrative to look at them as each individual and to talk to them and to engage with them and to see how they would want their portraits to be um, taken and painted. Um, so moving against sort of Gauguin as an individual and as a painter and sort of objectifying these figures and kind of try to give that power back to these people. Um, and these paintings are just gorgeous of these individuals in Tahiti um, and really sort of reimagines who these people really are. Um, a quote from Kahinda Wiley that I have, um, when one notices in Gauguin's work is a type of fantasy in which he is imagining a paradise where he can see himself as a European away from the civilized world, engaging in a type of self-realization through the bodies of the men and women who populate his paintings. And again, Wiley wants to give that power back to those people um, by creating these sets of um, portraits of how these individuals in Tahiti would want to be portrayed.
Happily, we get to move away from uh, Gauguin and move into talking about Vincent van Gogh. Um, probably one of those artists everyone wants to talk about, very famous. Um, he worked as an art dealer, a teacher, an evangelist, um, and discovered sort of Impressionism in 1886 and wanted to create sort of personal expression in his art um, through color. And so um, he kind of believed a lot, too, that modern art very much alienated people, which becomes sort of a, a big theme in modern art, that as sort of cities starts to grow, that people kind of become alienated more and more from one another, um, which Van Gogh felt um, particularly strongly about. He has a great sort of intensity for feelings um, and power in his work. Um, he produced it almost 900 paintings in his life, 860 total, um, which is insane. And Van Gogh was not very famous in his life, not really selling much work. Um, and most of what we know from him exists because of his interaction um, and letter writing between himself, here on the left, um, with his brother, uh, Theo Van Gogh. We have about a total of 844 surviving letters between them, um, a lot of them sort of including little sketches by Van Gogh as well and detailing some of his works. And so this is really how we know most of the ideas and information about Van Gogh and what he was doing. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have really get, gotten a sense for who he was um, as an artist because he really wasn't in um, the public spotlight. Um, however, I... Um, did have a professor who was very adamant that it's very hard to trust these letters. Um, and so this is sort of a random example that I'm giving you here. But what you have is that Van Gogh um, and his brother have this sort of um, relationship where Van Gogh is always trying to get his work sold and Theo, um, I should say Vincent, Vincent is always trying to get his work sold and um, Theo is an art dealer, and so Van Gogh, Vincent, I am going to fall into that habit now, um, Vincent is always trying to get him to sell his work, um, while also constantly asking Theo for money. And so what I had this professor say um, in graduate school was that it's hard to trust someone when what he wants to get out of Theo is money, right? So his intention is to um, gain pity. So let's say that you are talking to your mom, to your sister, to your brother, and trying to get a particular sort of um, thing out of that um, sibling. It's hard to take his his um, letters at sort of face value. Can we believe what he's saying? Do we believe him? Is he trying to sort of put on this facade for Theo? It's kind of hard for us to know. So while we do have a lot of information, we have to sort of take it um, as not sort of pure fact in a lot of ways. So when we have sort of these dramatic stories and ideas about him, um, remember to sort of think about the validity of those things. Can y'all hear my cat trying to eat my mushroom notes? Stop it, Ranger. So I know I could spend sort of all day talking about Van Gogh's work, um, but we're going to sort of focus on a couple of particularly famous works um, by Van Gogh. So this is The Night Cafe from 1888. Um, this work um, is in the interior Café de la Guerre in Paris. Um, the man who ran it, Joseph Michael Ginois, is on the right. Um, my French is terrible, I am sorry. Um, he posed for this painting and it's supposed to display this bar um, very late at night. You have these um, half curtain doorway in the back, which leads to more private quarters. Um, you have sort of the five customers at the tables along the walls, um, some of them looking quite distraught or exhausted um, as well. And this was considered sort of a um, all night haunt of local down and outs and prostitutes who are depicted slouched at tables and drinking together at the end of the room. Um, and he sort of spends his time um, detailing this work. Um, Van Gogh wrote to his brother Theo in August 1888, today I'm probably going to begin on the interior of the cafe where I have a room by gaslight in the evening. It is what they call a cafe de nuit. Um, they are fairly frequent here, staying open all night. Night prowlers can take refuge there when they have no money to pay for lodging or are too drunk to be taken in. 
And so Van Gogh spent a lot of time staying up late um, trying to record this image, um, possibly as he stated, three nights um, total and slept during the day to sort of paint the painting. And he really sort of wanted to get the kind of feeling of this work because it's sort of really wild. Um, it has the crazy, crazy use of kind of vivid colors. Um, we have the ceiling being green, the upper walls red, the glowing gas ceiling lamps, and the floor, which is yellow, um, in this sort of crazy use of perspective, right? We have this sort of drastic slant um, of this table and of the floors that is very sort of unnaturalistic in a lot of ways. And the gas lamps, you can see sort of the light emanating off of them. I think I have um, the great way that Van Gogh sort of depicts that with his brush strokes. Also, this kind of looks like a little woman in here. Um, the paint is very thickly applied, um, kind of supposed to show these sort of negative ideas about humanity. Um, very much kind of looks like a place um, where someone could ruin oneself or go mad or commit a crime. Kind of this very sort of dark and dingy place. Um, and it's kind of ugly, right? It's kind of ugly. It's kind of sinister. It's supposed to really portray these ideas. Um, apparently Van Gogh didn't really like it at the end of the day when he produced it. Um, but it is kind of this very powerful image of using color as sort of expressive form um, to get sort of the nitty gritty of this sort of nightlife place um, shown here. He did a couple of different studies as well. This is one of them in watercolor, um, supposedly. Gauguin also painted this space when he stayed with Van Gogh um, in 1888. And this is um, the owner's wife, Madame Guinois, um, on the right here. Now, for class, I had you guys talk about um, the bedroom, which is Van Gogh's work from 1889. Now, we're not going to talk about this work a lot because you guys did your formal analysis on it, um, but it kind of leads into some important information about Van Gogh as an artist, um, which you may or may not have known um, in sort of writing your responses. Um, but this sort of image of um, Van Gogh's bedroom comes from... Um, this um, time that he spent after being ill, he spent a lot of time in his bedroom and ended up painting it. Um, and although the work appears to be a symbol of relaxation and peace for the artist, to our eyes, the canvas appears to teem with nervous energy, instability, turmoil, and sort of this um, very sort of um, uncomfortable perspective. So I think there is some interesting um, ideas around this work that some people sort of see it as this relaxing space for Van Gogh, while others kind of see it as... Um, kind of hiding some tumultuous and uncomfortable feelings um, in the work as a whole. Um, but I wanted to talk about that during this time, um, Van Gogh and Gauguin start working together. So these are portraits they did of each other. Um, and they lived together in a house um, in Arles, I believe, um, in the Yellow House for 63 days. And Gauguin moves in with him um, and they painted each other and worked with each other. And there's sort of a lot of drama surrounding what happened. Um, one being that um, in this image in particular, you have on the right, um, the door to the stairway and the left, um, the door to Gauguin's guest bedroom. And what you can kind of see from this image here on the left is that the door appears to be ajar. Now we're not entirely sure if that is true. You can kind of see it um, here that it looks like it is open um, into Gauguin's room. And when you look at other images of um, the bedroom, because he did three iterations of this work, this is the one in the Chicago Art Institute, um, I believe. Um, we see that the bedroom is not open in all of these works, but is open in this particular one. And Gauguin did state um, that he was very uncomfortable living with Van Gogh um, because he would be awake at times and Van Gogh um, was often standing over him and watching him sleep and Gauguin would wake up to this. Um, so very strange um, that this was possibly happening, though um, I guess that depends on whether or not you trust Gauguin's word um, on the other hand as well. But um, it does appear to be true. 
um, from some capacity. But um, you can see that it's not necessarily um, as easy to tell in the other images whether the door is open, um, that he did three iterations of this. Um, but during this time that um, Gauguin and Van Gogh are living together, um, they do a lot of work together and sort of engage in um, sort of a post-impressionist dialogue. One of the interesting parts of that um, is this set of quote unquote portraits that Van Gogh does um, of himself and of Gauguin, and he does it in the symbolism of a chair. And I know that this maybe doesn't seem like the most interesting um, set of works by Van Gogh to talk about, um, but they're very interesting because um, Gauguin and, or sorry, Van Gogh kind of talks about both the artist's personalities just using sort of this inanimate object. And it kind of has this real power um, in the way that he produces these two paintings. So this first one is an image of um, the portrait of Van Gogh and Van Gogh's chair. And you can see it in his bedroom that he's utilizing these chairs um, as well. And it has this sort of very simplicity and sort of sadness and quietness to it. Um, he has a pipe and tobacco, as well as sort of the um, little flower box in the back. It's a very sort of simple chair, a functional chair, uh, not highly decorative, um, but st still sort of has value as well. Um, and it's clearly outdoors, um, maybe symbolizing sort of Van Gogh and liking to paint and experience the outdoors, um, but very sort of quiet simplicity in his chair. And now we look at Gauguin's chair, um, this work is very different. So here you have um, an image with a very sort of fanciful and decorator, dec decorative chair. Um, it's clearly inside during the nighttime. You can see the carpet um, as well as the sort of dark teal um, wall with also the lit candle in the background as well as on the chair. And um, they're very sort of two different personalities of the artist, where one is sort of um, very Baroque and very fanciful um, with the upholstered seats and the colorful carpet. You have Van Gogh's, on the other hand, being more simplistic. Um, so it's very interesting to kind of think about the way that Van Gogh saw the relationship between him and Gauguin. And of course, um, the sort of typical thing that everyone kind of um, remembers about Van Gogh is that while him and Gauguin are living together, um, Van Gogh does cut part of his ear, ear off um, and gives it as a gift to his um, to a prostitute named Rachel as a token of affection, um, which is very strange. And he didn't cut off the whole thing, um, just sort of a part of it. And Van Gogh has a very complicated love life, which I'm not going to get into right now, um, having to do with um, his sort of like prostitute girlfriend that he lived with for a long time and her son or daughter. Um, like I said, not going to get into it, but um, which caused Gauguin to move out um, and also for um, Van Gogh to move into an insane asylum. So, and that is what produces... Um, Starry Night in 1889. And this work was produced um, as he was um, from the view of an east facing window of his asylum room in Saint Remy de Provence um, just before sunrise here. So, in um, the asylum where he was staying after um, this sort of traumatic event, um, is where he paints this work. And there's other works as well, sort of daytime images um, of the scenery around Arl there. And he voluntarily did go there as well. Um, it wasn't something he was forced to do. He very much saw um, this is a place that he should be. So this um, painting is obviously very powerful. Again, another painting that is so much part of sort of pop art and the dialogue today about art and art history. Um, I don't know how many times you guys have probably seen this painting reproduced over and over and over again. Um, very much so this image um, 
is a sort of very expressive image of the sky. Um, you have that it's very turbulent and agitated with these intense swirling patterns that seem to roll across the surface like waves with these concentric circles and radium white and yellow light. Um, it's kind of, kind of sort of violently expressive um, in the way that you have these very intense brush strokes and thickness of paint that Van Gogh does. Um, if you are ever in a museum looking at Van Gogh's work, um, the way that Van Gogh applies paint is just kind of powerful. Um, this very sort of thickness. <clears throat> Some painters, um, like in the uh, when they're producing like medieval icons and work, um, in the past, you didn't want to see brush strokes, right? You didn't want to see sort of the impression of the artist, but Van Gogh very much embraces that in his work in post impressionism to give you um, the sense that you can see every single move that he makes um, in his work, and even like these globs of paint um, as well. You have the village um, down below the sky. It's a very hushed village of humble houses um, surrounding a church um, here with its very tall steeple. And you have that um, this cypress tree that is right in front of um, where Van Gogh is painting. And you can see it um, in these other works, like I said before, you can see the cypress tree right here. Um, but this cypress tree very much mirrors the steeple on this church. So he's very much looking at sort of the visual narrative um, between these two um, objects. The cypress could be seen as a bridge between life, as represented by the earth, um, or death. They're kind of known as a tree that's often in graveyards and used for mourning. Um, it could also be sort of a dreamlike state that Van Gogh is playing with, but it's very much sort of his expression, his emotion and intensity, this syntheticism um, of looking at a scene and expressing emotion through it, right? The power of Van Gogh's emotion in this moment in um, Starry Night. Now, while Van Gogh is in the asylum, he does sort of paint replicas of other works that he's seen um, because he's not allowed to spend as much time outside. So this is a work called Prisoners Exercising from 1890. It's um, very much um, inspired by an etching that he saw of a prison um, when he was in the asylum. And um, the description I have here is the painting depicts a group of prisoners walking in a circle around a claustrophobic prison yard surrounded by brick yacht walls with few small arched windows high up. The prisoners are parading past detectives so that they would remember their criminal faces. The work is dominated by depressing tones of blue and green in the shadowy depths of the yard with splashes of red on the better lit bricks above and two small white butterflies higher up. One prisoner at the front of the group, without a cap, um, seems to resemble Vincent with his turned head to the viewer. Um, and very much so that you have all these other sort of faceless figures. Um, and you can kind of see them here, but this is supposed to represent um, theoretically Van Gogh and kind of his own sort of personal psychological um, isolation and detention. I wanted to briefly show this work at the end um, by Van Gogh. Um, well, I actually do have one more, but um, to talk about this last one um, slightly. And this is really the last painting that he ever painted. And um, it's this very dramatic image um, of this cloud-filled sky with crows over a um, wheat field. Very expressive, very dramatic in the way that it's depicted with these kind of winding roads. Um, and sort of eminent darkness that's kind of coming over the image. And it kind of is this sort of horrific image of isolation um, with a central path leading nowhere. Um, and the crows kind of symbolize death and rebirth and resurrection. Um, and what we have coming to pass in July of 1890 is that he does commit suicide. Um, and this is the last painting that he produces. So it's kind of ironic too that that um him killing himself is really sort of the impetus for him gaining fame as an artist um and as an, as an individual and sort of um getting this sort of quint quintessential quote unquote tortured genius status um which is very sort of nonsensical but 
Um, in his sort of production of this very dramatic work, we have sort of this feeling of um, pain that he may have been feeling as um, an individual as he sort of dealt with his mental health um, and sort of the breakdown of that work and expression. I did want to show this work, um, which is very famous. I believe it is, no, it's at the Getty. Um, one of his most famous works that actually sold for the most money um, in 1987. Um, and it was sold for $53.9 million. So um, Van Gogh has gained quite a reputation for his work um, and his ideas. And um, and you imagine sort of selling a work for that much money and sort of what that means um, to this individual artist who sort of never saw this in his own life. Um, but it's very interesting to sort of think about the path that got him to um, where he was in post-impressionism. And we could talk for years <laughs> about Van Gogh as an artist, but we just don't have the time in this class, um, unfortunately. The last big post-impressionist painter we're going to talk about is Henry de Toulouse-Lautrec, who's a very interesting artist in his own right, um, as he was born to an aristocratic family in France and suffered from a genetic disorder um, and childhood accidents that left him physically handicapped and short in height. Um, his parents were first cousins, um, which is a problem. Um, and so his grandmothers were sisters and he had congenital health conditions, which were often um, attributed to the family history of inbreeding because they were aristocratic. Um, but at the age of 13 um, and 14, he broke both his femurs. And so his legs did not grow. So he grew an adult torso without adult legs. Um, it's part of a bone disease um, that he um, unfortunately um, received, um, probably in part because of this sort of inbreeding in his family. Um, but nonetheless, he moved to Paris in 1882 and had private academic training before he met Degas, who influenced his development. And he spent a lot of time in Montmartre in the lower class district of the entertainment district in Paris um, with a lot of sort of bohemian artists. And um, he was very sort of interested in um, brothels and prostitutes. And he was often made fun of. He had um, obviously, um, this genetic disorder as well as alcoholism um he even sometimes used his cane and he hollowed it out to keep alcohol in it um and he did indeed indeed die of alcoholism um as well as sort of syphilis um complications which um is similar to Gauguin like we talked about before um but in his 20 years or so of practicing he made 737 canvas paintings 275 watercolors 363 prints and posters and 5,000 drawings which is insane um so he became very sort of famous and prolific in um this period and kind of felt himself to be an outsider because um of his sort of disabilities um and sort of felt rejected by his air, um, aristocratic family. And so you do get the sense of that in some of his paintings. So this is one of his most famous at the Moulin Rouge from 82 to 95. Um, and the Moulin Rouge paid him to do work for them. Um, and he supported himself often through the production of works for them, um, including posters. And he very much wanted to sort of memorialize um, Parisian nightlife um, through sort of color and um expression and he was sort of a regular patron there as well um he is um in the background here with his cousin a lot of the other figures in this painting as well are famous um figures from the moulin rouge scene um the woman up in front here um seated at this table is jane avril um, who is a flaming um, had flaming red hair, um, and she was a popular entertainer. Um, to lose a track, even produced um, this poster of her here on the right, which is quite famous, um, in which you have her dancing dynamically with cropped image of um, a either a violin player or a cello player. Um, with the scroll of the instrument on the right, um, connected sort of visually with this musical accompaniment, kind of cropping this image like this is very sort of um, 
revolutionary at the time and you can see his signature here as well um very much he inspires a lot of art nouveau style of poster making that we'll see um, next week the preening woman in the background is la goulet Goulou. um again my french is horrific um but she was a very famous dancer as well this is a poster of her um a lithograph of her that um to lose a truck made as well and um when it, the moulin rouge opened he was commissioned to make this six foot tall advertisement with the launch um of the moulin rouge as well as his sort of poster career um with the spotlight on the crowded dance floor of the nightclub to its star performers um so her as um the glutton or la goulou goulet um and then um this figure as well in the back um, who was an acrobat, Valentine Le Desosse. Um, and that this is him, them there um, on the right, photographed. And they also show up in other works by Toulouse Lautrec. Here is them as well, um, dancing at the Moulin Rouge. The final famous figure is Mae Milton, who. Um, did not like the image and the way that she was portrayed in um, Toulouse Lautrec's painting, as you can imagine. Um, she has this very, very sort of green face. It's kind of haunting. Um, and it became sort of this um, controversial part of the painting that even when um, Toulouse Lautrec died, this painting actually was cut. And so you can even see it. Um, the Art Institute of Chicago owns this work um, and has restored it. But if you can see, hopefully, this kind of line um, here where you can see that they cut off May Milton's face um, to make the work sort of um, more desirable to um, purchasers, that um, people didn't believe that you could actually sell the work um, with May Milton's green face in it. Um, but they were thankfully able to get both the parts back because. Um, that's pretty hard to be able to do if you're sort of trying to destroy it. You have a lot of work being produced as well during this time of other like poster um, artists like Jules Charest um, and sort of this idea of Parisian nightlife expressed in poster making, something we don't get to talk as much about, um, but we're definitely going to see it in Art Nouveau um, artistry as well. What's great also about Toulouse Lautrec is you see him going behind the scenes and painting and drawing images of performers in sort of um, personal moments. So, for example, this is Seated Clown from 1896. Um, he was doing sort of these deluxe editions of Montmartre's performers, like the clowns, and um, this is Mademoiselle Cha U Kao. Um, and she was very famous and it has this moment of her in sort of quiet repose, kind of this glimpse into her persona as an individual, um, which is something people would not have necessarily seen otherwise. This final work that I have of Toulouse Trucks is very strange um, and kind of as sort of a side note, sort of a different um, take on Toulouse Trek's work and also Paris at the time. Um, this is an image that he did, Medical Examination, Rue de Moulins, um, 1894, in which you have two women in line, um, both who have their um, camis sort of pulled up here. Um, and they are being um, they are being checked for STDs. So part of um, Paris at the time was sort of this large issue with syphilis, um, which ironically Toulouse the trick dies of. And he goes to this um, brothel and he's sort of painting and drawing women there. And at this place, um, women were indeed required to get medical examinations to make sure that they were not carrying STDs, which is kind of insane. Um, there are about 34,000 prostitutes um, in Paris at the time. And so it's kind of this really strange image of Henry Toulouse, um, Henry de Toulouse Lautrec, who is a customer at these brothels, um, painting these women in sort of um, their daily activity. And it's sort of interesting to see these two different figures where you have this left woman who's blonde, 
who kind of has this look of resignation um, and her dress kind of gathered in the front so that she's not exposing herself versus her red-haired colleague on the right um, who has completely hiked up her um, camisole or her um, little dress here up over her shoulders with sort of no um, restraint with sort of great boldness. Um, so he, Toulouse Trek is kind of giving us this backs like backstage scene of what's going on in the brothels and how sort of the treatment of women um, is occurring. And it, not that it's a negative thing to, to check women for um, STDs, but this was sort of a large part of the problem in Paris and sort of the spread of STDs um, as a whole. Now, these last three artists we're going to talk about are sculpt sculptors. Um, who are very sort of influential and successful, um, Rodin being one of them. Um, his work is very important and we're kind of putting him in this sort of post-impressionist movement. Um, but he can very much can be considered sort of a symbolist, um, and sort of a progenitor of modern sculpture. He was very interested in modeling figures and unconventional poses. Um, he was kind of scorned by academic critics, but admired by the general public and his work, um, departed from decorative and formulaic sculptures, as well as themes of mythology and allegory. Um, very different work from the time, very sort of modeling um, the human body with realism. And he was sort of celebrated for um, the individual character and physicality of his figures. The work that you probably know the best by Rodin is The Thinker. It's a very famous work by Rodin of um, this sort of man in a um, pensive position. Um, and uh, The Thinker was made to sit over the lintel of Rodin's monumental bronze doorway that he was creating called The Gates of Hell. Um, and this figure was originally commissioned by um, the Museum of Decorative Arts in Paris, and it came from the inspiration of Ghiberti's Gates of Paradise and Dante's Inferno. Um, and it never really went um, anywhere, um, and he would make chaos casts of the series separately. It never, never sort of ended up where it was supposed to be. Um, it kind of um, lost its purpose in some way. But it became this really important work um, of the gates of hell and um, of this image of sort of this figure contemplating um, death and the damned. And so the thinker is seen here in the center above the doorway. Um, and it was originally titled The Poet. It was supposed to be an image of Danto. Um, others say that maybe it was supposed to represent um, Rodin himself, but it's really about this sort of tortured body, almost a damn soul, free thinking man determined to transcend his suffering through poetry. It became really popular among American patrons. Um, it became this sort of very famous image for um, kind of this pensive, thoughtful character um, with these sort of um, large muscles, this very sort of powerful um, male figure um, sort of being engrossed in thought um, and tension. And so this very famous work of his became sort of his um, work that everyone kind of knows him for, right? And you can imagine it was part of this very sort of smaller sculptural system. Other works that he produced on the gates of hell um, are very sort of gorgeous and tender um, and called The Eternal Idol and The Kiss here um, that I featured. Now, on the other hand, we have Clamille Claudel, who was in fact um, an assistant in Rodin's studio. And her accomplishments as a sculptor have long been overshadowed by the dramatic story of her life. Um, if you have not noticed, this is the first woman we've talked about um, in this set of lectures, which is very sad. Um, but she was studying sculpture in 1879 and became Rodin's pupil. And women are really not being taken seriously as artists. and um, I almost think her work is kind of better than Rodin's, but that's just my opinion. And what ends up happening is um, she becomes his mistress um, when she started in the studio. And they had this sort of 
um, long 15 year relationship, even though they had sort of a 24 year age gap. And she gets kind of cut off from her family because of this relationship. And she becomes dependent on Rodan financially. And sort of some psychological issues that come out of this. So as Claudel creates this sort of fantastic work in sculpture, um, in producing some of her great works like The Abandonment, um, which could be sort of a representation of her and Rodin's relationship, but is sort of this um, erotic moment of two lovers reuniting, very much influenced by The Kiss by Rodin, which we just saw. Um, as well as The Waltz, which is inspired by potentially the romance between Rodin and Claudel um, with these two sort of naked dancers um, frozen in a moment here. Um, and so much so that the, the female figure had to be more covered up um, while the male figure gets to be nude, which is um, sort of strange. But what we see happening in Claudel's work is that um, Claudel's life is very much overshadowed by the popularity of Rodin. Even if you try to kind of Google and get information about Claudel, it's very much overshadowed by, um, Claudel was Rodin's pupil and Rodin was a great artist. Um, and it's really sort of awful that, um, after her and Rodin break up, um, she is dependent on her father and then her brother when her father dies. And her brother sort of decides to kind of get rid of her by putting her in this asylum um, where she lives for 30 years. And a lot of people at this asylum seem to say that she was completely competent, um, that she didn't need to be there. And um, is really sort of this powerful way to think about sort of man um men in power and sort of what they're able to do to sort of the fe these female figures and their mental health at the time whether or not she was sort of experiencing any sort of mental health issues she still produced work she was still sort of competent people said that she seemed um relatively uh stable for the most part and she ends up spending 30 years of her life never being known about um and is buried in sort of this mass grave outside of the asylum after being there for 30 years so sort of this really horrific moment in um, her being this powerful female voice in sculpture that is overshadowed by um, Rodin's success as an individual. Thankfully, um, we get to talk about one more woman artist um, under post-impressionism, who's the first sort of black sculptor um, professionally, uh, which is Edmonia Lewis. And she has a very interesting background. Her father was um, a black man and her mother was um, a Chippewa Native American woman. And um, she's orphaned at five years old and goes to live with her mother's nomadic tribe. Um, and so she um, goes off to college to study sculpture and her career there kind of ends abruptly and she's accused of poisoning two of her white roommates. Um, which is insane, and um, is severely beaten by white vigilantes. And so she ends up moving to Boston um, to study sculpting and then eventually moves to Rome, um, believing that sort of um, Rome accepted her more easily um, as an artist. And so she goes and um, takes up a great career there um, in Rome and starts studying Greek sculpture and marble. And she produces some really fantastic pieces of sculpture. Um, this is the old arrow maker um, modeled in 1866 and carved in 72. Um, it illustrates an excerpt from Song of Hiawatha by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, um, where you have uh, the character Minnehana um, with her father and they're working on mats and rushes um, while her father makes arrowheads. And you also have this sort of... Um, dead deer as well um and that is because um as hiawatha sort of comes up upon them um he i believe he gives them a sacrifice of this deer um as a um a sacrifice to get the hand in marriage of minihana and so she often created um, ammonia lewis often created work based upon sort of her um, Native American heritage and subject matter um, because of her mother. However, 
in these works, whenever you look at them, which is kind of interesting and also very tragic, um, is the fact that she always makes um, her female figures look very idealized. And that was mostly because she did not want um, them to be associated with any sort of particular race or having people um, say that they look like Ammonia Lewis and she was trying to sculpt herself. And so when you look at a lot of her sculptures, which are fantastic and very um, gorgeous and well sculpted, um, a lot of her uh, female figures look very sort of Grecian or Roman, like in these very idealized ways. The other sculpture that I have of hers um, is Forever Free from 1867. Um, this represents a man standing, staring up, raising his left arm in the air that features a chain um, that is no longer restraining him, as you can see here. Um, and this woman on um, his right, who is kneeling with her hands in prayer. This um, sculpture she created after the emancipation of um, black slaves after the Civil War, um, very much sort of supposed to represent black liberation, salvation, and redemption. Um, and you have sort of this very heroic scene of the male figure standing up um, with his very sort of strong body and um, his shackles sort of being removed here. Um, and also him standing on this ball at the bottom, um, which would have restrained him originally as well. And you have this sort of idealized, again, female figure kneeling here, um, fully sort of clothed um, to sort of remove the sexualization of the image. But um, you have these sort of very powerful images by Edmonia Lewis, where she's expressing sort of her connection with um, the emancipation of um, black slaves at the time after Civil War. Um, and with this sort of very powerful image, very much sort of in this kind of Western canon of producing sort of marble sculpture, um, but giving sort of the power to um, her voice as an individual and as an artist. So I hope that wasn't too much information for you guys this week. We're going to be moving into the arts and crafts movement and Art Nouveau next week. Um, so I will talk to you guys all next week.